As we, uh, as we transition here, as Judy is going to teach, I want to just say this one thing about her. Judy is, a, Judy is a great teacher, and she's a teacher of the truth. And there's one thing that bugs me, really bugs me, and I'll tell you what really bugs me. Is this replacement theology. <laughs> that is the biggest crock of manure I have ever heard in my life. Doctor because if demon. you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna eliminate if you're gonna eliminate the Jews from what was established for what us what we have and us the one new man, then you're gonna have to eliminate Jesus. Because he's a Jew. Don't ever forget that whenever someone starts talking about a replacement theology. So this morning, let's welcome our sister Judy in the truth that she's going to share as she teaches us the significant part today. Okay, is this working? Okay, I think it's working. Um, first off, somebody dropped a silver bracelet back there by my table. Oh, it's crystal. All right. Redemption, redemption, redemption. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, the first thing I want to say, and I told many of y'all this week, Happy New Year. Um, this is the first month of the biblical calendar, and I woke up. We had a new moon this last week, and I wish the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Happy New Year. So this is the beginning of months on the Lord's calendar, on the biblical calendar. He is realigning things, and honestly, I was pretty amazed with what he's given me, how much of it was coming through on the words that were shared today, and I believe you'll hear that too. So we're going to talk about the feast today, the Feast of the Lord, Leviticus 23. Just so you know, there's one weekly feast and then there's seven annual feasts, okay? The weekly feast is Sabbath, and that needs a sermon all its own. And then there's seven feasts that are annual feasts, and I hope by the time we're done today that you're going to be really convicted and passionate about doing the feast this year because this is a jubilee year, and there's not a better better. Uh, time to do it. We believe the Lord began his ministry in a jubilee year. So, uh, because I said there's seven annual feasts. Okay, what? What? Raise the mic up. Can y'all hear me okay? They're saying raise it up. Okay, I'll try to talk louder too. Okay, remember seven is the number of perfection and completion. So the Lord is doing a complete and perfect work with these seven annual feasts. And we have to remember these are the Lord's feast. These are not Jewish feasts, okay? He says like in all those uh, scriptures in Leviticus 23, I can't remember how many there are, but like 43 or 44 times he says directly or indirectly, these are mine, these are mine, these are mine. And right here in Leviticus 23, 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feast. There he is. So a lot of people, and I'm doing this also for the live streaming audience. Welcome live streamers. And then for some of you that may not know, uh, there's three main things that people argue with. They'll go, well, Judy, you know, that's fine, but the Old Testament doesn't apply anymore. But I will say, in Jeremiah 31, the Lord spoke through Jeremiah that a new covenant was coming, and he was going to write the law on our hearts, which is what he intended to do from the beginning at Mount Sinai. He spoke the Ten Commandments into their heart, and then they stopped them. They were, like, terrified. No, no, we don't want to hear anymore. He intended to write all of it on his heart, their hearts there. Also, Matthew 5, 17, the Lord said, Do not think I came to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. And then Paul in Romans 7, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandments holy, just, and good. Another, another um, 
uh, uh, what is the word? Well, another thing that they say that we don't have to do this, they say, well, Judy, okay, the Old Testament is okay, but this is Leviticus. Leviticus deals with the priest and the sacrifices, so it's of no account. And it's true. The Lord did give a blood sacrifice that that removed sin. There are no more sacrifices needed. But does not, first, in First Peter, doesn't it say that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, which is repeating the words of Exodus 19, where the Lord chose his people? And um, there's treasures in Leviticus. Don't ever throw that book out. Seven times in Leviticus it says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Yes. Now, if the Sadducees and Pharisees had read that and taken that in a little bit better, they might have been better off because they took the law and twisted it into a religion of works. Works will never make you acceptable to God. Another treasure within Leviticus is it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So, you know, let's not throw Leviticus out. you got to dig a little bit. It still applies. Yes, the sacrifices are no longer needed because Jesus did it once and for all. And then the other thing is, well, I don't celebrate Passover. I celebrate Easter. Okay? Well, the F Passover has always been the Lord's plan. In the first century church, in the beginning, it was mainly Jewish, but you had Gentile believers. They celebrated Passover. And it was in 325 AD that Constantine at the Council of Nicaea made decisions. You know, a lot of more Gentiles had come into the church. Anti-Semitism, which is hatred of Jews, came into the church. And, you know, it just changed. By the third century at this council, they separated Christianity from Judaism. And Easter is, was born. But Easter is named after the wife of Baal, the goddess Ishtar. So, you know, we don't do Easter. But Passover is what the Lord intended from the very beginning to celebrate his death and cruci his crucifixion and resurrection. Okay, so, but, you know, that's kind of where that 325 A.D. is where the Gentile church really cut them off from their roots. And we don't want to cut ourselves off from our Hebraic roots whatsoever. So what are the feasts? Now, in Colossians 2, we have some clues. Colossians 2, 16 through 7. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So these feasts are a shadow of future events, and those future events, the entire substance of them is of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, hey, I, I think we want to take note of them and actually do them. Um, the first four annual feasts, and I'll talk about this in a minute, are pretty much fulfilled. But you got to remember all seven of these feasts kind of like have a past and a present and a future fulfillment. There's multiple layers to these feasts, which, you know, I praise God for that. This is the Lord's calendar, he has these dates on his calendar. These are like, if you want to celebrate holidays, let's celebrate these first. These are divine appointments. And, and you know, this all goes back to when uh, the Lord said to the serpent, you know, the seed of the woman's going to crush your head one day. Yeah. He has a strategic plan to redeem the entire world, and you see that strategic plan in these seven feasts. So, four are pretty much fulfilled, three aren't yet, so do you not want to observe them? I think you're going to see it more and more and more. Okay, I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of the feast and take some water. The first feast is Passover, foundational. This is the foundation. Without this, uh, none of the rest are going to matter to you. 
So you know in the very beginning, Passover was the exodus of the Jews from Egypt, okay? It actually is the 10th plague, the night that the angel of death came through and killed the firstborn, unless you had the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, okay? Well, the Israelites, fortunately, they obeyed the word of the Lord. They were saved. The Lord took them out that night in such a rush that he had instructed them not to put leaven in their, in their matzah. So they didn't have time for it to rise. It had to leave. And so that's the feast of unleavened bread. Okay. And then he took them through the wilderness to Mount Sinai where he gave them his law. Now, remember, the law is a moral code to live by. The law, intentionally, the Lord wanted it to expose their sin, to show them their conditions so that they would need their need. They, they would know their need of a Savior. Okay? Now, the big fulfillment of Passover was the death of Jesus Christ. And he would not have died on any other day than Passover. He was crucified at the exact time that the Passover lambs were slaughtered in the temple. And then he descended down into hell. Now we all know leaven represents sin and he stood before, here's the power. Here is the power. A lot of people don't talk about this feast, but this is where the Holy Spirit had the capacity to go down in hell and resurrect Jesus from the dead because there was nothing in Jesus that the devil could hold on to. So that matzah bread represents his sinless body. Leaven represents sin here, okay? The sinless body of Jesus is what that matzah bread is. And so praise God, he rose from the dead. And this is first fruits. Now, when, I left this out, when the Israelites left Mount Sinai, then you know they had to wander in the desert for 40 years, okay? Then they got to go into the promised land. They, this is the feast of first fruits. The first fruit, by the way, this is the barley harvest. The first harvest in the spring is the barley harvest. And the first part of the barley crop would be taken to the priest and he would wave it before the altar and every time I do this because it was the first fruits and that consecrated the rest of the harvest but every this first fruits is also Jesus raising from the dead let me see I think I have that scripture here but Christ is risen from the dead and it's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep so every time I do this, I think that up from the grave he arose, right? So Jesus is our first fruits. Pentecost, y'all know what Pentecost is. What is it? That's when the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room and, and inhabited and, and immersed and indwelled the disciples and everyone else there. This is the wheat harvest. Okay, now you know the Lord always begins with the natural and then the spiritual because he wants us to get it. He doesn't want anybody falling through the crack. So when you really study this and understand it, you see how he uses it to try to reach them. This is the barley harvest. This is the wheat harvest. The fall feast are the harvest of the grapes and the fruit. And I'll talk about these in a minute. But every male in Jerusalem was required, I mean in Israel, was required to go to Jerusalem three times a year. They had to go for the spring. They had to go for the summer celebration of Shavuot. You'll see the... I've got the Hebrew names there too. And they had to go for tabernacles or Sukkot. Okay? He's getting across the point. Look, folks, these are major events. Y'all getting that? Okay, fall feast. The fall feast begin with a feast of trumpets. Now, I agree with Asher Intrader when he says that this is incorrectly called Rosh Hashanah. 
That is a Jewish holiday that they took out of Babylon, okay, that they brought back to the land from exile with them. This is the Lord's Feast of Trumpets. Need another drink. And a lot of people say, we don't, we don't really understand what this is. But I want you to remember the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And I want you to imagine how terrified they were by the smoke and the fire and the trumpets and all that noise. I mean, they literally were so scared that they stopped the Lord after the Ten Commandments and said, no, no. This is a remembrance of blowing of trumpets. And he gave them this feast probably less than a year than they were at Mount Sinai. Trust me, they knew what this meant. Because there's two times trumpets are going to blow from heaven. One happened at Mount Sinai. And when is the second time? The return of Jesus Christ. And I have that. 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. We are, we, this feast, we are to look forward to that day, call for that day, train our ears to hear that trumpet call. This is the second coming of Christ. Day of Atonement has always been about the national repentance of the nation of Israel. This is the only time that the uh, high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And offer a blood sacrifice for the sins of the nation. The future prophetic view of this is when all Israel is going to be saved. And, oh, I didn't get that scripture. I forgot to put that one in there. But, you know, the scripture in the Old Testament that where it says he's going to pour out his spirit. And they will look upon him who was pierced. That's going to happen. But, you know, they're going to come to faith. They're going to come to Jesus the same way, and they are going to get saved. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And y'all remember we built a sukkah? The Lord commands you. We had it right over there. Uh, this remembers that time where they were wandering in the desert, and they lived in those temporary shelters. And they would look out at night, and they would see that pillar of fire. And during the day, they'd see that cloud. The Lord Jesus was with them. But anyway, in the future, this is when Jesus is ushering in his millennial kingdom. So, here we are. We have the first coming of Christ here. The giving of the Holy Spirit here. And the second coming of Christ yet to be fulfilled do you think you want to observe the feast? I would say yes, too. Now, um, there, when you get to the Passover story, so that's the overview. The rest of this, I'm going to talk about Passover in particular, what the Lord has given. Um, there are four statements in Exodus 6.6. 6, I am the Lord. I will bring you out. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. And those are the four cups that the Jews have in their traditional Seder. I want you to know I agonized with the Lord on this book. I tried everything in my power to put those four cups in. And every time I tried, he said, take them out. So finally I gave up. Okay. But the Lord said, back up a little bit. Right before those statements is the words, and I remembered my covenant. The covenant he made with Abraham. And that is a blood covenant that is indestructible. That really from Genesis 12 to the end of scripture covers everything. We have a mighty covenant God that is going to do everything that he promised. Amen. And the exodus of the Jews from Egypt was part of that. But also in that is him giving us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in this whole Passover Exodus story, he is described as the right arm of God. 
Now, if you want to talk power, you want the right arm of God, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we get to the Lord's instruction on Passover, there's only three things that he requires. He requires an unblemished lamb, which, of course, represents himself, the blood of that lamb, which means that lamb has to die, bitter herbs, which represents the bitterness of slavery in Egypt or in the world for those who are lost, and unleavened bread. Now, we already know that unleavened bread is his sinless body that got us the victory. This is a prophetic, really a powerful prophetic picture of Christ in the Passover. And now I'm going to just tell just a little bit of my journey. I'm going to share a little bit of my journey. I was raised in a Protestant church. I celebrated Easter, sunrise services, Easter egg hunts after church, you know, all that stuff. And I'm, we're so blessed to be here at Gateway. Bruce and I have been here 10 years and... As we've seen this church move more into the truth, away from Easter and stuff like that, we've done that too. I don't want traditions of men, okay? And Nicole, your word, or was it Nicole that gave the word? Oh, my gosh. Don't look to men. We need to look to the Lord in everything. And then what happened a couple of years into going here is I found out I have Jewish blood. It's just been hidden through the years, probably for survival reasons through my generations, but I do have Jewish blood. So what did I do? Well, I got this prophetic word that somebody that didn't know me, that I needed to dive into my heritage, and so I dove into all things Jewish. And there are some that have found they have Jewish blood that abandon Christ and go back they really are. You need to pray for those people. But what I found there is, and, and people need to realize, not everything Jewish came from God. They have their own pagan holidays and things along that line. Okay? And then I was like, and then I just stopped for about a year, and I was like, okay, this is crazy. I don't want the traditions of Christianity I don't want anything out of Judaism that did not come from the Lord. Now, hear me. I'm not anti-Semitic. I love the Jews. But I want the Lord Jesus and the fullness of his word, logos and rhema. And so I wound up in this no man's land between the two, okay? And you know what? If you've ever been in a void like that, I'm going to tell you it's an extremely creative place. It's actually a birthing place, and I didn't know it when I was there, but it's a place where the Holy Spirit can come and hover, and many things are birthed there, many things, ministries, whatever. And what he did, and you know what I found there in that place? I found the Word. <laughs> the Lord just ignited my passion for his pure Word of God. And it birthed this. This is the very first little Passover thing I came up with in 2011. And Tom and Patty and who else was there? There were a few of y'all there. We, I just did it in my home. Then Pastor Didi said, Judy, I want you to do home fellowships. And I said, Didi, I want to do something that takes in the whole word of God. And she said, go for it. I love you. I love you that I love our pastor's leadership that trust us to go for it. But how the Lord really set me free was the story of the Samaritan woman. She was in a void herself. She was a true worshiper, and she was locked up because she couldn't go to Jerusalem, right? Because they would have stoned her. And so the Lord, I know he heard the cries of her heart to worship, and he went and he set her free. Now, one of the things the Lord wants to do today is he's going to want to break off traditions and mindsets. And it's just been kind of confirmed through many of the words because the Father is looking for those who will worship in spirit and truth. We don't need anything from man that does not have the power than the living word of God. Okay? And we need to be careful 
with beliefs. And I want to tell you, I've got cultural mindsets of just living in the United States that I want the Lord to break off. They're everywhere. They're more, trust me, they're more than you want. The Lord Jesus tried to reach the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he couldn't. Why? Because they were spiritually enclosed with this false religion that they had created where they took the law and made it a religion of works. And he tried to reach them, but they weren't willing to let go. And most of them died in their sins, which he says in the word. So we can't have these things around us that are barriers between us and the Lord. I don't care if it's religion, doctrines of demons, you know, traditions of man, things along that line, sports, politics, spirit of poverty, whatever it is. If you're enclosed in something spiritually that is a barrier between you and how the Lord wants you to live, it's got to go. Amen. Peter was one. Peter, Peter was one. Peter had this mindset about the Gentiles that the Lord had to break that through a dream and supernatural encounters so that he would be able to walk into Cornelius' house. Now, if Peter had it, and Paul, of course, on the road when the lightning bolt hit him and the Lord, you know, I mean, if they had these mindsets, well, we have them too. So we have to have our eyes focused where the Lord's looking and not on this other stuff. So somebody had a word about that too, vision. So back in January, I heard the Lord say, and he said it very gently. He said, Judy, I'm not looking back. And it's like, okay, Lord, I know you're not looking back. You know, when you were resurrected, you didn't say anything about what they did to you, even though you went through torture. Uh, But he kept saying it to where I knew it was one of those experiences where he wanted me to ask the next question, right? Well, we know he's looking in the future. But he's going to answer that here in a minute. And then when I asked him, what's the gist of what you want me to share today? I heard very clearly John 6, 14 through John 8, 21. I wrote it down. Now, let me set the stage here. Um, John 6, 4 tells us, and if you want to open your Bibles to John 6, John 6, 4 tells us this is the time of Passover. So all of John 6 takes place at the time of Passover, okay? And prior to this passage, Jesus had just fed the 5,000, which this is for you, Al and Betty Jo. John 6 is for you. And um, go down to 632, Jesus tells the people gathered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He knows they're coming up on Passover. He knows they're going to do the matzah of Passover with the unleavened bread. He is trying to build a bridge between Passover and himself. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Hallelujah. And then as I was reading this with the Lord, go down to 639. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up at the last day. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. I will raise him up at the last day. Go down to 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will Raise him up at the last day. Jesus is not looking back because his face is set like flint and his eyes are right here. It's like, okay, Lord, am I hearing you right? You just said something three times. 
raise you up in the last day. Okay, so let's continue on. This is the message the Lord gave. I will tell you, the very heart of Passover is John 6, 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, there were some people that had problems with this. Go down to John 6, 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Well, you know, oh, well, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Now go to 66, John 6, 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Why did they do that? I'll tell you why they did that. They had a mindset that was not the mindset of the Lord. They had a mindset that they wanted to be out of this. They wanted out of this Roman occupation. And they wanted Jesus to be their king and, and all of this. I mean, the kingdom of God was right next to them. The son of God, the true bread, was right next to them. And they couldn't see him because of their own mindsets. And he's done everything in his power from the natural to the spiritual to try to reach them. Now, if they had known that scripture in Leviticus, it says the blood makes atonement for the soul. Well, you know, maybe they would have got it. But anyway, so now go to John 7, 7, 2. Very interesting the Lord tells us the Feast of Tabernacles was near. Now, you know, Passover was at the beginning of 6. Tabernacles, way over here, is at the beginning of 7. This is a whole feast year. I really believe these two chapters represent our age that we live in. Now, every morning in the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, they did a water libation ceremony, okay? They would pour water. They would draw it out of pour. They'd pour water. Well, the, the understanding of the Jews at that time was they wanted to pour out prophetic enlightenment. And they believed that the greatest encounter you can have with the Lord is with the prophetic. So, go to John seven thirty seven. On the last day, here we have it again, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood. Now remember, they're pouring out the water. They're desiring prophetic enlightenment from the divine. And he cries out, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Here in John 6 and 7, we have the whole cycle from Passover to the Feast of Trumpets. And the Lord's eyes are fixed here. He is the bridegroom looking forward to his wedding night. And he wants everyone to be there. He doesn't want to miss any. He doesn't want anybody falling through the crack. Oh, Lord Jesus. He's the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end of redemption. This whole calendar is his calendar of redemption. Now, the Lord is building his spiritual house, okay? We know that from Isaiah 28 and 1 Peter 2. I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. And who's the cornerstone? Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then in 1 Peter 2, we come to him as a living stone. We are built, being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. There's priesthood again. To offer up spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. So God is building this house. And you know what? It has to, these stones have to fit right. And I love Pastor Ofer from Jerusalem. He was here, oh, maybe a year and a half ago on a Thursday night. He gave a revelation that just blew my mind. And he talked about in the old days when they were building the temple, they had to go away from the temple to carve and sculpt those th stones. Because those stones had to be the exact shape 
of the cornerstone or they would not fit together well. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem and seen those ancient stones, they fit perfectly. But they couldn't have the noise of that hammering. They had to do it away. And so it is with us. We're living stones in the Spirit. And the Lord is sculpting us and he's breaking stuff off of us. And Lord Jesus, please take the rest of it off of me quickly. Because we have to fit perfectly with that cornerstone. Or, or that house isn't going to be what, the, well, let's just say they're not going to put that stone in place until it is a perfect fit. So it might seem strange that the Lord wants to break off stuff, but he wants us freed so that we can enter into everything. And we have been called. You know, the Lord Jesus is crying out in John 6 and John 7. But you know, he, he was crucified and he died. He was resurrected. He's not here anymore. So guess who's been commissioned in this time period? We have. We are sitting in between Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets. And we have... The Great Commission anointing on our life. And I think Pastor Dave, you mentioned that this morning. You mentioned Mark, and I'm going to read it. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Folks, the Passover, the Passover lamb is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. The Lord wants us to bring Passover into our home. Our home is a spiritual house. All of our spiritual houses corporately make up this house right here. This is the house of the Lord. Now, I've got a quote by Jack Hayford, and this kind of says it all. Listen to this. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ is greater than both the energy of our own humanity and that of our adversary. The power that saves is also the power that releases, delivers, and neutralizes the enterprises of hell and the weaknesses of the flesh. The appropriation of the power of the blood in tough situations is intended for every believer in Christ to know, to understand, and to employ. Uh, don't we want that? We want that, Lord Jesus. Now, Passover has always been about personal redemption. I'm kind of getting away from my notes here. <laughs> Passover has always been about personal redemption. And what better picture of the Lord can you have? I'm not adding anything to the picture that he portrayed. You've got the lamb that represents him. You've got his shed blood that represents fullness of love that he would give his life for us. No greater love. You have the unleavened bread that means he resisted every temptation and he walked in sinlessness. <sighs> and then you have the bitter herbs. So when you look at the Passover table, folks, you're looking at the choice before every individual person of either life or death. You can partake of the lamb and his body, and you can cover your heart. You can drink his blood, which spiritually brings a covering of his blood over our heart. And if you refuse that, then you will taste the bitterness of God's wrath. This is Passover. Passover, you've got a choice of either redemption or eternal separation from God, which is, I think, pretty, pretty darn bitter. I don't want to take, take part of that. Now, I, can I keep going a little bit? 
I feel like people are falling asleep. Wake up, everybody. Don't, don't fall asleep on this. There is another, okay, there is another Passover coming. And it's the whole thing where there's a second death coming, and we don't want to be a part of that. We need to make sure we're in the spiritual house of the Lord. The, his blood is covering our heart. But I'm going to just leave you with this to, to meditate on. I'm not going to go fully into it. Study the story of Rahab and Jericho. Guess what? Ray, the walls of Rahab came down right after they had celebrated Passover on the plains of Jericho. If you want a picture of the future Passover, look at Rahab. If your house and your heart is not covered with the blood of Jesus, I mean, Rahab was the only one that she brought her family in. They told her to put that red cord hanging out of her window, which represents the blood. Everything else was destroyed. There is a Passover coming. There is a tribulation coming. There will be a land of Goshen, just like if you compare Passover with Revelations, the plagues and stuff, very similar. There is a land of Goshen. So it's just awesome for us to move into that. Okay, I'm going to wind this up. And you know, Ray, Rahab was honored. She's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. She's an overcomer, and she is the mother of Boaz, who is referred symbolically as Jesus. Okay, so the Lord wants, um, and I have to say this part because I skipped over it. This is a year of Jubilee. This is a year that the captives can go free. Don't give up on your children, your friends, your loved ones that you've been praying for. Don't be afraid to say to your kids that hate religion, I love you too much to spend eternity apart from you. Bring them into your home and give them the gospel of the Passover lamb of Jesus Christ. Okay, now we're going to pray. And for those of you who want to have every mindset every tradition, even if it came through your lineage or if it's something you picked up, any doctrine, anything, the Lord wants to remove this stuff. We can't have these structures and these barriers between he and I and, and yourself. So if you want that, stand up. And the Lord's not going to remove anything that's not, that's of him. Amen. So Lord Jesus, we call on you right now and we call on the army. You are the master and commander of yes. the armies in heaven. Yes. And so we ask, Lord, and we command that all spiritual barriers that come from mindsets or from doctrines or beliefs or traditions that are not of you, we ask you to break them down, break through them, and penetrate them right now in Jesus' name. We want to see your kingdom. Break it through. And addictions. If it's pornography yes. or drugs yes. or alcohol that builds these spiritual enclosures around you that can be a barrier, Lord, we want nothing between you and I, and we break it all off now in your name. Now, the Lord said, he gave me that first part of John 6, and it starts right where Jesus walked on the water. So I was like, okay, Lord, I get the rest of John 6 and John 7 and what you did in John 8, but why did you start me right where you walk on the water? And I heard him say, you've got so much stuff around you that's not of me, I can't walk on the water to you. He wants to come to us in new ways, so don't be surprised if you're laying in bed and he walks through your wall. <laughs> Or you're in your car and he transports you because after he walked on the water and he got in the boat, they were immediately at the land. He transported them. Yes. You know, we don't want to be startled. We want to be so much out of this culture 
that we fully expect him to walk on the water to us, to get in the boat with us, which was Benjamin's word about the boat, and transport us places and to walk yeah. through walls. This that has been broken off yeah. opens you more to that in Jesus' name. Amen. You want to, Pastor Dave, you want to impart the fire for the lost? Yeah. Um, Father, we thank you in this place. Yes, Jesus. That part of that Feast of Trumpets included this most glorious fire. Yes. Jesus. And we ask right now that you would begin in your very kind yes. way. Jesus. To remove each and every one of those things with your cleansing. Yes. That we would walk out the fullness of what you have. Yes. For us. And so deliver us even now, Lord, from those things that have caused a separation between us and yes. you. For this is a brand new day. A brand new year. Yes, it is. The year of Jubilee it is. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the blood yes. of Jesus. Yes. And Lord, we thank you. We surrender our hearts to you. For those that have never done that before, we give you our lives, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We put our faith and trust in Yeshua, Jesus. Yes. Cleanse us, Lord. Thank you for already forgiving us. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we forgive. We forgive ourselves yes, and we amen. receive That's right. the precious gift of Jesus in our yes. lives. We yes. receive you as our Lord and Savior. Yes, Lord. Lord, we're never going to be the same. That's right. Father, we amen. thank you for sealing this in the blood, in the blood in all of our lives. Lord, yes. That we will walk out never the same. That's right. Fire for salvation. Yes. Now, Father, we're not going to just sit here in mm -hmm. church. We're going to go right. out there. And yes, spread Lord. the fire for That's souls. Right. Fire Woo! for the harvest. Yes. Fire for yes. salvation. Yes. Now, Lord, we will be active. We're, we're Lord God, in active duty. Yes, Lord. Lord, there's no such thing as retirement. Lord, we thank you for the harvest. In Jesus' name, amen.